You'll notice that many YouTube technical channels use the Ryobi OnePlus system for power tools, and this isn't because we get sponsored by Ryobi in any way, it's just because it's a very good system. It uses one battery for a whole range of power tools, including impact drivers, SDS drills, angle grinders, circular saws, hedge trimmers, just the works, it's very good. And it came to my attention recently, rather annoyingly, that it's a lot cheaper to buy kits of these tools from America, and... The only downside to that is that they come with this very generously sized charger. It's, they don't even sell this charger in the UK. It's the 30 minute charger. What's it called? It's called the, uh, where is the, does it say on this word what it's called? Um, oh, it's the P117 charger. And they come from America with this, but it's only for 120 volt. And they don't seem to sell them in the UK. It's it's odd. So uh, apparently you can get uh, ones that have been converted to 220 volt from America. Um, but I thought it would be interesting to take a look inside one and see exactly what the circuitry is like to see if it's easy to convert yourself. So let's take a wee look at the circuitry. I'll put this stuff out of the way. So paper in. pen. The power supply starts off with a fuse. So here we go. Mains in. Mains in. And it goes through a fuse, which is reasonable enough. Then, directly after the fuse, is a metal oxide varistor, this little green component down here. And that's clamped across the mains. And the point of the metal oxide varistor is... It's a resistor which has a, normally a very high resistance, but as soon as the as soon as our voltage is exceeded, it's, it clamps down and it, its resistance drops. And the point of it is that if there's any sharp transient spikes on the main supply, it will shunt them out. It will just act as a little crowbar to shunt those out. And this one is unfortunately, it's a, the number on it is. ZOV10D271K. So that's 271K is the important bit here. 271K means it's actually 270 volts. And you think, well, it's 240 volt supply. Is that a problem? Well, yes, it is, because that's the actual voltage it will start turning on. That's what it's designed to handle up to before it starts clamping. And if you work out the peak voltage of the main supply. Say for instance in the UK our supply is 240 volts. Supposed to be 230 volt to comply with European regulations but it is actually 240 volts still. So we take 240 volts and that's the RMS value, that's the average value. If you multiply it by 1.41 that gives you the peak value which is roughly 338 volts. So that's in excess of this voltage. So that's a bit annoying because uh, that means that it's not just a simple case of just sticking mains into this unit, which you wouldn't want to do anyway as it as it happens. The next thing in line is an NDC inrush limiter. And this is just a resistor. Let's put T degrees centigrade. It's an NTC and it starts off with a fairly high resistance. In this case it's only 2.5 ohms, but it means that when you turn the power on and it's it limits the amount of current that can flow in initially through the circuitry. And then as it warms up with the current flowing through it, its the resistance then drops. So it's basically just an inrush limiter. So then it goes to a capacitor across it. And in this case, it's quite odd. It's, it must be a multiple standard capacitor because this one, it says X2, but it also says MPX 250 volt AC, 275 volt AC and 310 volts AC. The 275 volts AC is pretty typically what's marked. I'm guessing this is a UK compliant one. So X2, 100 nano, and it's 275 volts AC. And across that, just to remove that little risk of a slight tingle, are a couple of resistors, discharge resistors, uh, 470K, 470K, then a common mode suppression choke. Now, a common mode suppression choke is a little sort of uh, inductor. This is it here. And it's got two windings on it. The, both the mains windings are wound on, but in such a manner that any common noise generated by this, any common high frequency noise generated by this unit, 
the current flowing in will uh, create a magnetic field in one direction, the current flowing out will create the magnetic field in the other direction and they'll help cancel each other out. It's just a very efficient way of suppressing sort of electrical noise. So that's it. Uh, we have that's all that's all the filtering. So here we have AC now. Then we go to a bridge rectifier, and just for convenience, I won't I, I'm going to keep that separate. So we'll draw the bridge rectifier here. And it's got four discrete diodes. In this case, they're using um what are they using in here? 1N5408. Uh, that's a kind of semi-guess because I've just been looking around. There, none of them are actually pointing the right direction that I can see the complete number and there's bits and pieces, but I can see 1N and the la I can't. The only digit I can't see is the 5, but I kind of know that it's 1N5408, which is a 1000 volt 3-amp uh, diode. It's a pretty common diode. So we've got the AC in, and I'm just going to draw it... Uh, that's technically these connections, it's just easier and less cluttered to draw it as a AC in here. And if this is positive, this is negative, so we've got all the diodes in the bridge rectifier point towards the positive. And you think, well, so far, this is a, a fairly straightforward thing. The only thing that's really sticking out as being not UK compliant is the fact that uh, it's got this metal oxide varistor at the lower the lower voltage, and then you're you're looking at the capacitors here. So this thing feeds two capacitors, and normally in the UK for 240 volt supply there'd just be say one capacitor, but in this case there's two capacitors in series, and then rather oddly there's a link, link, going to the middle of those capacitors. And this is very common topology. It's a very common arrangement for uh, dual voltage supplies where that link would actually normally choose between 120 and 240 because what's actually happening here is this link is rendering these two diodes completely void. They're useless. They don't really have any major effect. What's happening here is that on one half of the main cycle, say for instance, uh, this, this terminal is negative, then this is negative and this one's positive, so current flows through this diode and this capacitor gets charged up to the peak of the 120, the 120 volt supply. So let's see, 120 volt supply, 120 volts times 1.41 equals the peak voltage is going to be about, say, 170 volts. So that's going to charge to 170 volts. And then when the polarity reverses, this is going to be positive and this is going to be negative, and through this diode, this is going to be charged to 170 volts too. So you add the two of them up, that comes to 340 volts. Okay, so that's what the switch mode power supply is designed to for. Now it's interesting to note that when you design a switch mode power supply, you can get the multi-voltage range ones. Uh, you know, look at the little LED lamp power supplies that will run from everything from about 90 volts to 250 volts. But it's actually, in the case of uh, beefy switch mode power supplies, it's easier and it's just it's more efficient to actually design them for a fixed voltage. So what they've done, they've designed this for around about the 350 volt level. Now, technically speaking, all you'd need to do to convert this to 240 volt operation is remove that link. Because then this full bridge rectifier kicks in and these two diodes in series, they're, they're rated uh, 220 microfarad at 200 volts each. Oh, microfarad at 200 volts each. And that adds up. With the two of them in series, that actually add, it, it means that they're rated about 400 volts, but uh, at about 110 microfarads total. And theoretically, all we have to do is just cut that link and that would be converted to the 240 volt unit. But first of all, we're going to have to change this metal oxide varistor because the two, this metal oxide varistor is just rated too low. Now, I kind of delayed in this project a wee bit here because I thought I was going to have to place an order with Rapid Electronics and a bit of a bugbear. Uh, Rapid Electronics, when you spend above about £30, they offer free shipping. Except the Isle of Man, because no matter what you do, if even if you order £2,000 worth of components, they slap on an extra £10 delivery charge to the Isle of Man, which... Very few other companies are charged so much as a surcharge. I mean, normally when I sh ship stuff to myself in Man, 
it's the only difference in cost between shipping to anywhere in the UK and the other man is something like two pounds. It's I don't know why they slap on such a big surcharge, but if I order a small number of components and then you know. I would normally be paying a shipping charge, but then they slap on that big surcharge. It means that I just don't order from Rapid as much as I used to. So um, I was thinking, yeah, you know, I'll see what I've got in stock. And one of the things I had in stock with this was this little um, suppression module that I ripped out of something else. And that's got three suitable metal oxide varistors. So I've scavenged one, and this one is rated... Uh, this one is called 14D471K. The 471K means this is rated for 470 volts peak voltage before it starts turning on, and that makes it ideal for this application. The other thing, and this is odd, very odd, normally across these capacitors, when you've got two capacitors in series like that, you have to allow for the fact that capacitors, no matter if they come from the same batch, no wonder if they're the same model, whatever, same value, you have to allow for the fact that they will have slightly different leakage currents and slightly different values through tolerance, and it's normal to put resistors across them to balance them. And there's no provision to do that in this circuit. And that could result, technically speaking, in the voltage of one capacitor drifting way different to the other one, and uh, I'm not sure why they haven't done that. Uh, I just always thought that the textbook example of using capacitors and series like this was to add these balancing resistors, so I'm going to add some balancing resistors. And initially I was thinking it's only about 170 volts across each one, because even with uh, full wave rectified uh, 240, what was uh, full wave rectified 240? It was 240 times 1.41 equals 338, so yeah, it's still, you know, it's still round about the same. Uh, so that's about 170 volts across each capacitor. So I did consider using 220k resistors because it doesn't have to be much. It just has to roughly match the natural leakage current of these capacitors because all capacitors have a slight leakage through the dielectric. And I worked out that if I'd used 220k and it's 170 volts, well, let's do the maths. 220k, 170 volts. So the current through the resistors would be um, I equals V over R, so it's 170 volts divided by the 220, oh, 220 K, and the current through it would be roughly about 0.77 milliamps, say 0.8 milliamps, and that's not really an awful lot, is it? Times 170 would give the power dissipated, so it's 130 milliwatts. The, the, the standard quarter-watt resistor is rated about 250 milliwatts. Well, it is quarter-watt, so that would be well within its rating, about half its rating. The voltage they're rated for is about 250 volts. This is only 170 volts, but then I got some of those resistors out and they just look so small. So what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to actually put... Uh, 200k resistors in series across each one. Be a bit cluttered on the board. Um, I would prefer to have just got a beefier 220k resistor, like half watt for its higher voltage rating and its just chunkier size. But uh, that's what I, this is what I'll be using. So what I'm going to do to convert this unit is cut that link out. The link is this link in between these diodes. And I'm going to change the metal oxide varistor to one that's better rated for UK mains voltage. In this case, the full number on this thing, which I just think I, I already read that, uh, is 14D471K. Very common uh, type of metal oxide varistor. And the resistors across the output. Technically speaking, the minimum you'd have to do is change this and cut that link. I'm going to add the resistors across the capacitors just because... I think they should be there, so I'm going to do that right now. Okay, the deed has been done. So what I've done as a recap is I changed this underrated green metal oxide varistor here for one rated for the UK mains voltage. I cut the link in here called J14, jumper 14, and optional, I put out a little bit of captain tape here and put across each of these electrolytic capacitors, these big electrolytic capacitors here. I put two 100k resistors in series 
across each of those capacitors, just as a pair of resistors across each capacitor, just purely to act as a sort of balancer and also because it helps act as a discharge resistor. And while I've got this uh, open, let's take a look at the circuitry. So, in here is a switchboard power supply chip, and next to it are a couple of capacitors. One of them is the bootstrap capacitor, so it can derive its own power once it's actually kicked into action. And that'll be the, what this little diode down here is doing. There's an optoisolator for feedback, and then there's a transformer with a couple of Class Y capacitors in series, which is great, nice to see that. Uh, what is the value of these Class Y capacitors? The value of these Class Y capacitors is... Whoa, it's tiny. Uh, 2.2 nano, but they're 2 in series, so roughly 1 nano. <clears throat> okay, on the output we've got another heatsink at the other side, which is just for a diode. And there's a chip here, the chip that does all the work has its number scrubbed off. <coughs> yeah, tacky, but probably some little microcontroller or something. However, beyond the microcontroller, possibly in case it crashes, uh, it's notable that the current to the battery is controlled by this relay here. And if you follow the tracks through, it comes from the main positive from the rectification diode here, through the relay, through a fuse, and then to the uh, battery, positive battery contact. The negative is connected from the transformer here through a current shunt, a current sensor here, uh, and then to the negative. And the there's another winding in this which uh, goes through a, a simple, simple diode, then it's a capacitor, and it's obviously to derive a general power supply of the circuitry. There's a quad op amp here which I'm guessing is a precaution. It's probably extra circuitry just in case the battery, the processor crashed or something, and the battery starts getting charged too much, and it pro can probably control the relay to kill the power. But, uh, the feedback in general normally uh, is from the... Uh, circuitry controlling this opto isolator and saying, "I want more, you know, I want more current through the the switch mode power supply." So it's quite interesting. I guess the fact the relay has to be on to actually, it has to be energized to connect the battery means that if you turn the power off, that relay is going to cut out, and it's also going to effectively disconnect the battery apart from from some. Actually, it's going to pretty much disconnect it completely. Because the only other thing I see here is some uh, capacitors across the battery, tiny little capacitors, two of them in series, built-in redundancy. It looks a very good quality power supply, but then it is Ryobi. I would expect that, to be honest. So, um, yeah, it's pretty neat. The modification uh, is, technically speaking, all you have to do is change this metal oxide resistor, cut that link, and in my case, I added those resistors. It's a fairly straightforward thing to do. I'm just about to put this back together, and then I shall test it and... See you shortly when I'm doing that. Here's a, a couple of things worth mentioning. There are actually one, two, three, four, five, six screws in here. They don't need to be taken out. Uh, you can lift the whole circuit board out without taking those out. Another oddity from a technical perspective is the negative terminal is divided into two sections. So instead of actually sensing, I'm guessing that's a sense uh, connection for sensing the voltage in the battery, instead of just sensing it from the sort of charge contact that's going on to it, it's the charge contact is going on, and then this is acting as a second contact to see what the voltage is actually on this terminal, on the battery itself. That's quite an interesting thing. Right, that's it back together. I thought it's time to share the moment. Another thing worth mentioning, the flex that's obviously attached to it is American. It's single insulated. It's up to you. You might be... You might prefer to put a, a typical British double insulated or European double insulated flex in. It's two core, um, and let's power this up and see what happens. Will it go bang? The red LED is lit, um, showing power. Let's plug a battery in. It's analysing it, and I heard the relay click, and now it's charging the battery. So I'm going to leave it uh, for a while, and uh, yep, to charge that battery up, and... Uh, Yep, that looks like a success to me.